when an expert appears in the local newspapers on the subject of this dress of mine, a friend of mine told me, couldn't you have chosen a more sexy title? I don't know how sex comes into this title, but it's true, reading the title, judicial review of a transaction in Malta, time for reform, it's a question mark. It's true, it's, it is not an exciting title, but in actual fact, the title covers a subject which is extremely important for the rule of law and democracy in our country. And basically it is, when does, when do the courts have a right to review actions of the government? Now, in Malta, we are blessed because, as usual, we take the best of two worlds. Our cuisine is American in the morning, Italian at lunch, and English at supper. Even our legal system is very eclectic. Our public law is basically based on English public law. Then, private law is based on the continental Roman law. And then in criminal law, substance is continental and procedure, and God is British. <laughs> and even here, in constitutional law, we have adopted the American idea of constitutional review, that is to say, the Constitution is supreme, and therefore, if government acts in contravention of the Constitution, you can challenge the constitutional validity either of a law or even of a government measure. But at the same time, we have adopted the English system of judicial review. As you know, in the United Kingdom, there is no written constitution, there is no constitutional court, so there is no constitutional review. But they have review, review arising from ordinary law. That is to say that over the years, presumption evolved that when Parliament grants a power to government minister, the government minister is presumed to exercise that power, that discretion, in an ordinary way, in a reasonable way. So we shoot with two guns, if you want, <laughs> in order to challenge something which the government does. And by government, I am referring to the entire administration. So it's not just the government minister or the civil service, but it, it would include any local council, whether it's from Fontana, or the smallest, or Dina, or else the Kirkana. Those are all public corporations. It could be the University of Malta. So whenever a public authority exercises a discretion, either in excess of its authority, I should explain this, or in breach of the rules of, of natural justice, there is no definition of what natural justice is, which makes it even more interesting, or else when there is abuse of power, that is to say, the discretion is used for an improper purpose, or irrelevant considerations are taken into account. Incidentally, about six or seven years ago, there was an interesting judgment in the UK, <coughs> where a conservative-led local council, just on the eve of a local or a generation, launched a very generous scheme to buy your own home, when it is owned by government, the council of homes. And the auditor criticized this general scheme, and it was declared null because an irrelevant consideration, that is to say, politics, gaining votes on the evil election, was not a proper purpose to exercise one's discretion. And they were ordered to refund the local councillors, were ordered to refund the difference between the market price and the general scheme and the price coming from this general scheme. Imagine if this were to be applied in more than post. So it's a pleasure yet to come. Now, how did these norms arise, emerge in the United Kingdom? It all goes back to 1590-something. The sewage commissioners in London were empowered to fix the rates, the sewage rates, which each household had to pay. And these commissioners decided that everyone pays the same rates. It was like the Poltex 400 years ago. And someone challenged before Lord Cook um, 
the fact that the Jewish commissioners were imposing the same tax, the same rate, for the same sewage rate for every household, irrespective of size. And the argument of the commissioners, which was the same arguments which governments for 100 years later, even in Malta, used to defend their own actions, the law says that we shall fix the rates as we may, as we may deem fit. And for the layman, when he reads the law, if it says, as he may be fit, it means just that. But the courts have said that, and this is 1594, in the Rook case, that when Parliament grants a discretion, even if it does not state that you have to exercise it in a reasonable way, it is presumed that you have to exercise it in a reasonable way. Otherwise, the presumption is it would not have granted that discretion to a government minister or not. Okay? And therefore, Lord Cook said, this is unreasonable that you fix equal rates to all houses, to all households, irrespective of the size of the household or of the territory. And then there was another case, the Bats case, which became very famous because he was a local councillor in Plymouth, and he passed some rude words vis-à-vis uh, -vis the mayor. <clears throat> I will not tell you what the rules were, words were, but basically he turned round and he told the mayor his son or something. And he was dismissed, and probably they were, I believe, it was correct that they dismissed him. I mean, this was 1650, uh, insulting the mayor of Limited. But it was declared unlawful, not because the mayor did not have a right to dismiss Mr. Bags, but because he was not heard before he was dismissed. So this right, whatever you have done, to be heard before you are dismissed, and therefore the dismissal was and now it was declared unlawful, not because of the merits of the mayor was not right in dismissing him, but because the, the correct procedure was not was not followed. Now this is just an appetizer of what is about to come. How did the common law of England influence Maltese public law? In Malta, we have a rule which you won't find in any statute. It's a judicial doctrine. It has been developed by the courts. That whenever we have a loophole in our public law, not private law, our public law, since our public law has been inherited from Britain, we were a British colony for 164 years, then the courts may, it is not an obligation, it's a discretion, the courts may apply English rules of common law, not English statute. There was one judgment recently, about 10 years ago, which applied an English statute. <laughs> not even when we were a, when, when we were a colony, it's English statute applied to water. I mean, the English statute, that's just this thing. This applies to water. So if English statute law did not apply to water when we were a colony, now that we are independent, uh, full member of the European Union, etc., it doesn't make sense to apply English statute law, but English common law, the common law as has been evolved by the courts of law, not based on statute, that is applicable to Malta, but only in the field of public law. So in the field of civil law, if you have a dispute with your neighbour, English public or common law or private law does not come to the picture. But if there is a lacuna in public law, then we may, we may apply English rules of common law. And since there was nothing on judicial review, of government action in Malta until 1995, therefore our courts used to apply English common law. The famous case of the Blue Sisters, which I should, which I refer to in a moment, was based purely on English common law. Then in 1995, Parliament passed the law amending the Code of Civil Procedure, whereby it encapsulated the most important rules of judicial review under English common law in a multi statute. So now we have a statute. Even though it does not cover everything, but anyway, we have a statute, which is Article 469A of the Code of Civil Procedure. So when I refer to Article 469A, I'm referring to the multi statute post-1995, containing basically, however, still the English norms of public, public law. So 
So that is why we have two reviews. We have the judicial review, the orderly one, which is the subject of this lecture. And then, just in case that does not work, we also have the constitutional review. And it's important because you can't go for a constitutional review if you have not exhausted your order remedy. So there have been cases where the court declined to, exer declined to exercise its constitutional jurisdiction because you did not avail yourself of the remedy under, for instance, <coughs> or under the normal rules. So constitutional review is always, uh, it's always a, a remedy of the last resort, which makes the subject, therefore, even more important. So it is through this judicial review, through this window, that actions against government were pre-1995 instituted on the basis of common law. Now these rules of common law, as I told you, are based on a very simple notion. What did Parliament intend when it gave you that discussion? First of all, that did not exceed the authority within which that discussion was given. And don't forget, in the United Kingdom, there is the law of parliamentary supremacy, parliamentary sovereignty, there is no one above parliament. So the courts cannot annul a law passed by Westminster, but they can interpret the law to see whether the executive, the government, has abided by the law or not. So if, for instance, most of you remember the repetition orders, which used to be issued until 1995, post-1995 is no longer possible, to issue requisition orders, but the pre-1995 requisition orders are still in force. Those requisition orders could only be issued in the public interest. Orders to provide living accommodation. But can you issue a requisition order to assign requisition premises to a bad club, which is a private organization, or the works still to be used as a club by the party government? And here we have conflict. Judgments. So in 1980, for instance, the Court of Appeal, not even the Court of First Instance, the Court of Appeal decided that an extension of a political party club could be made by assigning requisition private property to the party government to have a larger club at power. Years later, years later, the Court decided that doing the same in Santa Bella was not in the public interest. So at least now we evolved that political parties cannot benefit from requisition premises. And what about the land? I remember a year before I was born, I don't remember, I remember the second part, but a year before I was born, in Kirkop, the local band club, you can imagine how many members there are in the Kirkop band club of San Diego Ardon, wanted premises in Kirkop. They knocked the door of the minister, the minister issued a requisition order, and they requisitioned the premises of the Vellan family, who later on became my clients, so that they would have a Vellan. Thirty years later, this time I was a lawyer specializing in human rights, etc., etc., they wanted to extend the club because they didn't have a hall for rehearsals for the band. So, they again requisitioned property belonging to the Vellan family, the same family whose property had been requisitioned for the original club, so that the extension would be made always at the expense of the Vellan family. And I argue that giving a club to a club which already had premises was not in the public interest. And Chief Justice Suponichi acceded to this request and decided that it was not in the public interest for a private organization of an extension of the band. As the Italians say, l'appetito viene mangiando, that is to say, the Bella family said, ah, so we can now challenge the first, the first uh, revision order, but in the meantime, the Constitution Court, because this was not an administrative case, it was a constitutional case, said, you know, there have been developments in, in the European Court of, uh, of Human Rights and giving a club to a, to a band club uh, is, is in the public interest. So you see how fluid this ground of review is. There was, there was a case, 
exactly which is some gossiping cases. There was a case of someone with a quarry who was using it to dump building material in it, and <coughs> government expropriated this quarry so that other quarry owners would also throw building material in this expropriated quarry. And of course, the owner said, this is not fair, after all, this is my quarry, I am using it for my own, my own use. And the court of first instance decided that this was not in the public interest. However, in, I think it was Giacchino or something. Bujay. Bujay. Um, uh, however, the, the court of FP said, no, this is within the public interest because this will prevent others from dumping the building material in the countryside and in the country roads. So, you see, there are always two sides of, of the coin. And there have been, uh, mostly, 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 mostly this first ground of review, excess of authority, usually hovers around the interpretation of public interest in, um, in requisition orders. For instance, there was one, if you requisition property to give it to a lotto receiver at a time when the lotto was run by government. Was that in the public interest or not? Now, don't forget that at that time, we used to, as a, as a government, the government used to receive around about 2 million Maltese Lini as profit from the lotto, from the running of the lotto. But the lotto receivers were private individuals used to make commission, and then the government makes a profit. In spite of the fact that the government used to make a, a profit, which went to the public fund, for which our pensions, our social services were paid, still the Constitutional Court, in that case, of the District Court, said that this was not a public, a public interest. Giacchino Progenio was 2012. This does not mean, however, that each time the public interest is involved, it has to be a public project. So if the project is owned by a private company, but it has a strong public purpose, like for instance a private hospital. When the St. Philip's Hospital was, was built, the access to the land on which the hospital was built was very narrow. So government expropriated private land leading to St. Philip's Hospital, so the, 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 the entrance road would be wider. This is the Kutaya case um, and the, in, in 2001. And the court said it's true that it is run by a private company, it is a private project, but it has a public interest purpose. Freeport, which is you know still state owned, but run by a French private company, that is still a question a public project. So even though it is managed by a private uh, company. The second ground of review, which is even more interesting than the first is the rules of natural justice. Why is it more interesting? Because there is no definition of what rules of natural justice mean. So even though now we've included in our own statute a ground of review called rules of natural justice, we still refer to the English common law in order to interpret what these rules of natural justice are. And when do they apply? There is nothing in our law which states when do we apply the rules of natural justice. Any government decision, after all, government is elected democratically, to govern, and you can't interfere each time it takes a decision. So if, for instance, government recognizes Kosovo, as it did in 2008, and should it consult everyone before, should it, because one of the rules of national justice is to hear on both sides. Should I hear both sides, those who are in favor or against, before I recognize Kosovo? So, in the United Kingdom, they have developed a rule that these rules of natural justice apply only when a decision is being taken by a public authority which will seriously affect the rights of an individual. Now, what does seriously affect? And the courts, our courts, in spite of the fact that there is no such limitation in our statute, even after 469A, still apply the English norms of common law as regards the sphere of application of these rules of natural justice. One of the most important cases was that in 1988, the Mary Greg case. Mary Greg, the sister of Gomentov, had applied for a permit to build her <coughs> front garden, it was a, a 
attacks. And thirdly, it was an atrocious time. But that was issue, according to law. But if you go today, there are, there are these front gardens, and all of a sudden there is this room which was built on the front. It was issued, there was a change in government in 1987, and at the time there was no planning authority, so the PAPB was part of the executive, part of the government. And they revoked the permit, and they had a right to revoke the permit because the permit itself said that the permit could be revoked within a period of one year. Mary Greg won the case, not because government did not have the right to revoke the permit, but when you revoke a permit which was validly issued, it had been validly issued according to law, you have to first hear the other side. And they did not allow Mary Greg to make representations. So it was a procedural point. But what is interesting is that there is no definition, so the rules which we have evolved as to what amounts to rule of nature. Just as that one, you can never be a judge in your own cause, so I cannot issue a permit to my own brother. Okay. Secondly, the most important one is you must hear the other side. Audi, not the car company, Audi, listen, antenna part, listen to the other side. Now, in England, they have developed this to the extent that if they are going to expropriate your property, they must first hear your side of the story and then they expropriate the property. Most of it will die around. First, they expropriate the property and then we we'll listen to what you have to say. <laughs> so, this is a pleasure yet to come for the lawyers amongst you to challenge. These are the new trends, like the one which I mentioned of deciding cases on a political basis to gain votes launching general schemes on the election where one can challenge the legality of that of the decision. I want to tell you also that <coughs> in judicial review, unlike the constitutional review, the courts limit themselves to declaring that this is unlawful. They will not substitute their discretion to that of the public authority. So if for instance I apply for a for for to be recruited in the university case which happened with the ex deputy speaker Manuel Borja. He was 58 and he applied to become a full-time lecturer at university. He was already a part-time lecturer and he applied to become a And he was not chosen and he argued, I was not chosen because of my age. Now had he applied to be an Olympic sportsman, of course one can take age into account. But when you apply to become a lecturer, should one take age into account? The more so if he had more academic qualifications than others, and he won the case. But then he also took a pay. But when he won the case, the court did not order the university to recruit Manuel Morda. They announced the promotion exercise, the recruitment exercise, sent back the reports to the University of Malta, and then the University of Malta again starts the recruiting process, but has to decide in the line of the judgment. But it could have refused him the second time to be admitted as a full time lecturer, but not on grounds of age, on other grounds. This is important because, unlike in the Constitutional Review, the Constitutional Court can do anything. It can order, it can even order that the Electoral Commission adds two extra seats to Parliament. It doesn't emerge from any particular provision of the law, except that the Constitutional Court can apply any remedy. While in the case of judicial review of administrative action under ordinary law, it can only annul the process. One of the most interesting cases on the rules of natural justice was that of Edward Sullivan. Madame Edward Sullivan owned two ships registered in Morgan. And all of a sudden, he received a notice to the effect that the registration was being cancelled by the minister for public, for maritime affairs, in the interest of Maltese shipping, without giving him the reasons why that cancellation was taking place. Now, in the law itself, there was no provision that the minister, when he cancels a ship registration, had to give reasons for the cancellation. But there was a provision that the ship owner had a right to make representations. Now, this case goes to show how 
finally, whatever the law states, the courts are going to apply the law, and the courts can read between the lines. And Judge Kamala Khan, incidentally, each time there is a new start in any sphere of law, usually it's always Kamala Khan. You'll find his name, whether it was um, uh, uh, stopping once and for all the application of the ULM, the doctrine that if you exercise the sovereign power, the government can be sued, etc. Whether it was the liquidation of civil damages and accidents, etc. And he said, Kamala Khan, it is true that. The law does not state that the minister has to give real reasons for this decision, but how can the ship owner make representations, which is a legal right, if he is not given the reason for such cancellation? And then even more so, when there is an appeal from a decision of a public authority, how can I appeal from a decision of a public authority if I am not given the reasons for that decision? So now we have a third rule of material justice, apart from Nemo Universe and Causa Propia and Audi and Trampartem, that the public authority has to give reasons for its decision, which is different from that it has to be correct, even if it's a stupid decision, but there have to be reasons for the stupid decision. It can't just say yes, no, or I cancel in the interest of what you should. So now we can challenge anything done by government. Now, what is government? According to law, it is the ministries, the departments, local councils, all of the 68 local councils, and public corporations. Which means public corporations are corporations which are public owned, you can't have a private entity having an investment in a public corporation. Yeah. And there has to be a law setting up that public corporation, MEGA, Planning Authority, the University of Malta, MCAS, the local councils, all these are set up by law. It does not seem to include government companies like El Malta, which are neither part of the civil service, nor are they a public corporation. But there have been some judgments, I feel that they are erroneous, even though they have a good purpose, which extended the protection of the judicial review also to companies in which commercial companies, so there are commercial companies regularly registered under the Companies Act, which, in which government has a controlling interest, usually a majority of shares like in Malta or like Arms Limited. But there are some judgments which state, yes, these fall under the judicial review. I think this is a wrong but the The purpose is basically, probably, the courts are trying to spread the net of the review as wide as possible. The third, and in my view, the most interesting judicial review is evidence of power. And the law merely describes abuse of power when someone in public authority exercises a power for an improper purpose or by taking irrelevant considerations into account. And here the classical case was the Blue Sisters' judgment. And for those of you who are too young, some of us of course are not so young, but those of you who are too young to remember the Blue Sisters' case, or rather more than that time, I shall explain very briefly the facts of that. In 1911, a lady by the name of Emilia Zamit, then she married Clapp, so it became Zamit Clapp, built a hospital in St. Julian's Cinema at her own expense and donated the hospital to the government under certain conditions. Some of them were trivial, that were trivial for us, not for her. That her painting or the point of her portrait should, should uh, be hung in the lobby of the hospital, that uh, the name of the hospital should be should be in clan, etc. But that was an important condition that the running of the hospital was to be in the exclusive hands of a congregation called the Little Congregation of Mary 
popular, you know, as the blue systems because their habit was partly blue, partly white. So if you used to go, used to say, I'm going to the blues. Okay? But that was technically the Zambian club master. For a number of years, no problem at all. In 1980, government passed the law, and it was a good law, that each hospital needed a permit. There was no law regulating permits for hospitals, because most of them were public hospitals. And in the law, there was a provision to the effect that the minister, in granting the permit, the license, or renewing it, could <coughs> attach to such permit, such license, any condition he deems fit. He deems fit. Now, for the layman, that means, I will use some of these phrases, he has whatever he wants to. But in actual fact, that is what the courts do not want. And the condition which was imposed by government, believe it or not, way back in 1980, was that there were the usual hygiene, health related conditions, that you have to sweep the floor, keep the, put the, put the place clean, engage only uh, consultants, qualified consultants and nurses. And then the last condition was, and at least 50% of the hospital facilities and beds have to remain available. Have to remain available to the national health scheme. Compensation to be discussed later on. It wasn't even compensation. The nuns refused. I remember this case because when it came before the court, Mr. Justice Herrera, the father of the Minister Herrera, appointed the interpreter for the Irish nun, Sister Luigi Duncan. So I was interpreting all these uh, all these submissions made by Vanya Moreno on behalf of the nuns to Sister Luigi. Duncan, and I was given the criticism of therapy pounds, which at the time was, was quite now. So I remember it even for this pragmatic practical, practical reasons. So the argument of the dance was this is an unreasonable condition. This condition goes against the spirit of the law, because the spirit of the law, when Parliament gave you the right to impose conditions, was to impose health-related conditions, not use the law to expropriate. Not half the hospital, at least half the hospital. And the second argument was that once government had accepted the contractual obligation in the nation deed that only the sisters could run the hospital, that condition goes against the contractual obligation of the government to allow the blue sisters and only the blue sisters to run the hospital. They won the case. And this, I think, was a groundbreaking case because it paved the way for what I call the post to sisters um, uh, jurisprudence on, on reasonableness, for instance. And now I come to the Stoppini case. And the Stoppini case, the technical name of the case is Sacred Farrugia versus Contra of Police, 1997. <coughs> It's an important case because I believe it was one of the few judgments which, at least before the Court of First Instance, because the magistrate's court in the super, superior jurisdiction in Gozo, accepted with success for the applicant the ground of review of legitimate expectation. What does legitimate expectation mean? If for a number of years there has been a policy whereby a permit is granted under that policy, you can change that policy. But you have to give due notice to my legitimate expectation. So if the light fireworks used to be let off from the citadel since time immemorial, you can't cancel that policy a week before the third Sunday of July. I'm correct, it is the feast of St. George, okay? So it's a very appropriate case to be <laughs> mentioned in this, in this forum, in this case. And the lower court, the court of first instance, and I will quote what it said, of course I have translated it from, from Maltese, in acceding to the request of Saviour Farrugia, who was the secretary or president of La Stella Benfica. Who was the person who did the, the fireworks. And Saviour Farrugia, but that was in the Benfica. Uh, I think it was La Stella Benfica. Okay, La Stella Benfica. Uh -huh. um, he, he, the, 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 the magistrate, who well, I believe is somewhere here, said as follows. The rule of law, so you see we go back to the rule of law. What does the rule of law expect of a public authority? The rule of law requires a 
and presupposes that an individual should know a priori beforehand his position regarding the state of fact through laws and regulations which are clear on the relative map. So, okay, you can change your policy, but don't change the policy just on the eve of the feast when for decades the permit used to be issued and not be suddenly faced by all kinds of conditions which we could not have foreseen before as happened in this case. So, so it ruled the court that the adherence to a new policy suddenly ousting the old without warning when there was a legitimate expectation so it wasn't applying for something illegal, it was applying for something which for the left of fireworks according to law. And there was no law prohibiting the lifting of fireworks from the That was a okay, question of policy. That amounted to an irrelevant consideration being taken into account. Now this is an area, legitimate expectation, a fertile area for evolution development. Because this is the only case, I think there was another one on the retroactive application of a tax, but that was more an interpretation of any new directive and regulation. Here, there was no new directive, no regulation, it was the, the magistrate, the one presiding over the court of first instance, which as you know, the magistrate's court in Malta, in, in Gozo, in superior jurisdiction, has the same powers as the first court of the civil court in Malta. Um, applying common law as an interpretation and including legitimate expectation as an abuse of power if you breach it. So you are ignoring, so you either apply an irrelevant consideration or else you ignore a relevant consideration. As in the Borda case, you ignore his PhD and you take age and relevant consideration into account. Unfortunately, this judgment was reversed in the Court of Appeal on a technical point because the Bank Club had instituted the action and the Court of Appeal said, ah, oh, the action should have been instituted by the fireworks manager who was going to let off the fireworks. Now here, so you have no difficulties. Now here, now here, please, can I open a parenthesis, a bracket, because I have started the crusade along with others against this notion of Juridical interest. In English law, they call it legal standing. Okay? Juridical interest. In public law. In public law. In private law, thank God I have juridical interest. So if I have an issue with my neighbor on the dividing wall of my roof, the Opera Morda, okay, and what is called the Opera Morda will tell him, I have to institute the action. You can't come along and say, Look, your neighbor, on your board's neighbor, has infringed the law. So I will institute a case without on your board being involved in force. Perhaps I do not want to institute an action against my neighbor. Or else you are dividing the estate of your parents, and someone, a stranger, comes into a private law action and says, I will institute a private law action. So in private law, thank God we have to be this. Which incidentally does not arise from any other law. Any law. It is a doctrine which evolved in our jurisprudence. Our, our judges and magistrates developed this notion of juridical interest. But when you apply juridical interest to public law, you can undermine the supremacy of the very constitution. Let me give you an example. Let's imagine that a minister is appointed by the prime minister without being a member of parliament, which is a breach of the constitution. English rule that to be a member of part, to be a minister, you have to be a member of parliament. In England, you can be from the House of Lords or from the House of Commons. But in Malta, we don't have a House of Lords, and therefore you have to be an elected member of the House of Lords. Now let's imagine that the president signs that nomination, that appointment. Who has a juridical interest interpreted strictly as it is not being a case? That it has to be actual, personal, pecuniary. Who has a juridical interest? The Prime Minister who appointed you? Of course not. The President who signed it? Of course not. The Minister who has been appointed, even though he's not a member of Parliament? Of course not. Perhaps you can say the other government members of Parliament. But the Prime Minister can 
szerintem de nem utóbb van az ott a pontja. And this arose for the first time during the Royal Navy ship's visit of 1988. The Prime Minister of Malta invited the discussion to send some Royal Navy ships to Malta. They came to Malta and a group of NGOs tried to block the visit by saying that this goes against the neutrality of Malta because we'll have a concentration of foreign forces in Malta, which carried as a visit of three Royal Navy ships, in breach of our constitution. Now, I will not give you the merits, I think on the merits, these NGOs were not, not right in, in, in their interpretation of the law. But to block their action also on the fact that they do not have legal standing, they do not have juridical interest, these environmental organizations, I think was going a bit too far. So who has juridical interest? The Prime Minister of Malta, who invited them, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, who sent them, the captain of the Royal Navy ships and the crew who were having a good time in Malta. So, this strict interpretation of juridical interest means that neutrality does not mean anything. In practice, let's imagine if Malta, in breach of the Constitution, were to join in. In breach of the Constitution. So the opposition party cannot file an action, no, because that's a political interest. So who can file an action? The member of the armed forces who is sent to the NATO mission probably would like being sent to the NATO mission because they are paid three times as much as they are paid in one. I'll give you an example, which I mentioned later on. When the morning after Bill was allowed in Malta and authorized by the superintendent of public health, a group of NGOs, pro-life NGOs, filed an action stating that the morning after Bill is not a contraceptive, but a pill which destroys a fertilized egg that amounts to abortion, and abortion is illegal in order. Now I will not deal with the merits of the case because I am not a technical person. Some say it is a contraceptive, others say that it leads to abortion. But to tell the NGOs whose work is to protect life from conception that they do not have a juridical interest to file an action means who can file the action? The lady who swallows the pill, those who produce the pill, the husband if he realizes that his wife has, or her, his partner has, has, has swallowed the pill. So here we are creating a situation where government is allowed, if what the life of the as our state is true, to break the law with impunity. Or even worse than that, break the constitution with impunity. So I believe that, as, as usual, the English courts have taught us how to find the middle of the road approach. Because they used to have that problem, this problem a hundred years ago, and they solved it by saying, not every Tom, they can carry, can institute a public law action, but neither do you need to prove juridical, personal, peculiarly actual interest, provided you prove sufficient interest. So an NGO like Greenpeace has sufficient interest to block a decision for the building of a new nuclear station in the Kingdom. And the father of Mr. Rees Mogg, who what used to be the editor of Sunday Times, was allowed judicial action to try and block, without success, the ratification of the Maastricht Treaty. And Mr. Dos Santos, as Joel has just told us, one of the two plaintiffs in a case going back to 2016, where he argued, and Paul, uh, along with Mrs. Miller, that before government triggers off Article 50 of the European Treaties to start the Brexit negotiations for Brexit, government had to go back to the Westminster Parliament and pass a law. That action under judicial review, which was won by Miller. And Dos Santos, Dos Santos was not addressed. <coughs> Had that case happened in Malta, the court would have told Mr. Dos Santos, bring the proof that you are going to cut less hair and you'd have less lines at your salon 
and if more that is the real one, rather than it remains, which I think is stupid. There was a case going back to 1916, there was a Scottish nobleman, Maverick, and racist, who objected to the appointment of some British citizens of German origin. But since they were also of Jewish origin, probably it was a racist motive that he objected to the appointment of these UK of Jewish descent and German descent from being appointed to the Privy Council. He lost the case because the motive was racist. But he did not lose the case on the basis of legal standing. It was such an important action that the English court said, no, this is an action which may can be instituted by any private individual, but on the merits, you have no case. And they rejected the case, but not on legal standing. The same applied to the case of Claudette and the Jewish and Philip Council of Party in 2013, when they argued that they should have been elected through the election proper and not through the co-option process when additional seats were assigned to the nation's part. Now you can tell me both of them were MPs, just the same, whether you enter through the main door or through the side door, you have entered. But I think the politician has a right to argue that he should have been elected in the election proper, the proper and not through the co-option process. The court said, since you are a member of parliament, that's enough, you have no political interest to challenge the way you have entered into parliament once you have a parliamentary seat. So I hope, I tell my students that I say this all the time, but again, perhaps someone, someday, might be appointed a judge and he would say, I don't remember that old demented person who used to tell us about doing this and perhaps change the law. Why? Because here, changing the law does not mean getting a new act of parliament. What you need is only a trust, a new beginning by our members of the judiciary to change, to change only for public law, the interpretation of what juridical interest means. So I'm not saying that it should become an actio popularis, an ex popularis, an action where you don't need to prove any interest. I'm not saying that. But it should be a different interest, much more diluted, when you apply for a public law action rather than a private law action. Now, on unreasonableness, apart from the Rochester's case, there were other cases, for instance, a local council of Zerbuch Malta awarding a tender to a new company rather than the old cooperative uh, uh, for the collection of garbage. And this cooperative launched a campaign. They barricaded the law, their own Zerbuch reading to the local council's office. They did not allow the new contractor to start collecting garbage. They even threatened the local councillors, and on the same day that the award was given, they met again at 9 o'clock in the evening, reversed their judgment, and gave the tender to the cooperative. Of course, that was uh, acting under duress, and the, 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 court, the court of appeal annulled that discussion. But sometimes what happens is that the courts confuse the two issues. When you exceed your authority, it doesn't mean that you have acted unreasonably. And I'll give you an example. An importer of a harmless drink decided to name this drink, this drink cocaine to attract young persons to drink it. It was not a drug, but he used the name of a drug to describe this harmless drink. And the controller of customs <coughs> confiscated this drink. He won the case, and he won the case on two reasons. One, I agree with the first one. I don't agree with the second one. The first reason was there was nothing in the law which allowed the confiscation of a harmless drink just because it was called something else. And there I think the judge was right. But to say also that the confiscation was unreasonable, when there was a national drug policy saying that objects should not be named after drugs, I think that was going a bit too far. I'll give you another, another example. The Brinkat, in this case, is the Old for Property, a <coughs> strange name for the case, Old for Property, 2014. There was another case, the Brinkat case, 2016, July 2016. 
were the foreign spouse of a Maltese national. As you know, after five years, they can acquire Maltese citizenship. In the meantime, during those five years, they are granted exempt status. So they can work in Malta, they do not need a special permit, they can leave Malta, return to Malta, they can live in Malta. Now, the exempt status of this foreign spouse was withdrawn by the government because the Maltese spouse had been condemned to prison. And for three years, the foreign spouse never visited her husband or her partner in prison. Now, doesn't this raise a suspicion that the marriage was one of convenience? So, the government withdrew the exact status uh, of the foreign spouse. Now, she won the case because before withdrawing the exam status, she had to have been informed and she should have been allowed to make her representations. And that is correct. But to say that the withdrawal was unreasonable is confusing the two issues. Something can be beyond the authority or in breach of the rules of natural justice as regards procedure, but it is not unreasonable. Unreasonable means that no, well, this is a big issue of regime, begging the question, no reasonable person would have reached that conclusion. And we base ourselves on the interpretation of reasonableness on a very interesting case, immediate post war British case, the Wensbury case. Wensbury is a town outside Berlin. And in 1946, this was a time when Sunday was a sacred day. In fact, in Britain for a long time football matches were played on Sunday, not on Sunday. And I remember attending the Conservative Party conference in San Francisco Thatcher in Blackpool, resolutions being passed by the grassroots of the party to restore the sanctity of the day of the Lord of Sunday. Well, the Wednesday Local Council issued a regulation to the effect that on Sunday, minors under the age of 16 could not go to the cinema even if accompanied by their parents, let alone if they weren't alone. So even if they went to watch Father Christmas on 42nd Street, which was the Walt Disney film at that time, it was most popular, they were not allowed to go to the cinema even if accompanied by their parents, just because it was a Sunday. So what they were protecting was not what the minors under the age of 16 watched, so it was on the basis of censorship or of the content of the film, but it was based on the sanctity of something. And the British, I think it was the House, the High Court of the House of Lords, first gave us a sort of list of what amounts to reasonableness, and it is still used today. So the judges refer to the ones with the rules, in the same way as so they would say shank. They know what shanking means. The rules related to shanking treatment. And when in English case the one refers to Wednesday, you are referring to these rules to decide what's reasonable or not. But strangely enough, the judges found that the directive and regulation of the local council was perfectly reasonable. So in, in laying down the rules of reasonableness, which are still quoted today, on the merits, it was the government which won and the individual which was. Imagine today if one were to say it is reasonable to prevent. My name is under the date of 16 to watch the most Sunday in the midst of all this film. And this usually applies, usually when you impose an a priori prohibition, then it's always of dubious constitutional validity. For instance, when in the early 60s, newspapers condemned by the Catholic Church were not allowed inside government hospitals, government lost the case mostly because it was a blanket provision. So irrespective of the contents of the newspaper, what is called the Catholic Church, it does not enter a Catholic hospital, but a public hospital. So all these blanket provisions, prohibiting everything, like a carpet bombing, uh, against the US, which are usually declared to be unconstitutional. To conclude, can the possibility Force which one may encounter in filing a First of all, you have to 
So it solves your own remedies before you file the judicial review action under 469. So if you have a right, if you have a right to appeal from a decision of the planning authority to the planning authority appeals board, you can't go directly to the ordinary boards. First you go before the appeals planning board of the planning authority and then afterwards you may file your case before the judicial review action. Second, and this is a very dangerous rule, you must file your action within six months from when you knew or you should have known about the decision of the public authority, which is very dangerous because even if they don't notify you at all, but you know that they have refused your request to open a retail shop in Victoria, for instance, then the six months start running. And if they don't reply at all to your request, then after two months, it is presumed that the answer is no. If the answer is no, then the six months start running from the expiration of the two month period, which is very dangerous. So a rule which was enacted in favor of the individual, because I remember I was a minister for 16 years, as I told you, sometimes the position of the civil service is neither to say yes nor to say no. Because like that, you cannot be criticized that you took a decision. But that is a decision. After a two months, it becomes a law. So if I request anything from a public authority, not from a private authority, from a public authority, after two months, if I do not receive an answer, unless of course they extend the period that I agree with the extension of the period, after two months, the answer is no. If it is no, a decision according to law has been taken, and the six month period triggers off. And the six month period is parentally, that is to say, no exception. Even if I go to the Ombudsman, so let's, let's, let's assume that the decision has been taken in my regard, and I appeal before the Ombudsman. Now, the Ombudsman is found, the office is found in the Constitution, it is entrenched by law, etc. The period I spend before the Ombudsman is not added to the six month period, so if the Ombudsman rules against me after seven months, I cannot then institute, which is very stupid. I cannot institute the action under the review review because the six months have elapsed, which is like telling people, file an action. File an action. Because if you go to the Ombudsman, that time which you spend before the Ombudsman is both not being deducted from the six month period. Another pitfall, which I hope someone will challenge the Constitution someday. is that before filing an action against government, you must file a judicial letter. We have just ten days, ten days before you file the action. And what is so unfair is not that this is discriminatory in favor of the government, but if you file the action on the ninth day rather than on the eleventh day, it is rejected. So the court will not allow you to, to file the judicial the, 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 the judici letter and they will continue with the case. No, it is declared none. So you have to withdraw the action, pay the cost, and file the action. And your six months are passed. And, and, and when someone tries to use this argument that this should be added to the six months, the six months is parental. Which is, I think, very unfair. It is discriminatory. It gives a procedural advantage to the government. Because when government files an action against you, it is not obliged to send a letter 10 days before it files the action. Another question which sometimes arises is <clears throat> I mentioned this before, it has to be a public. So commercial companies in which government has a majority is not enough. There was one exception where the private company running the casino, the Kursal, was allowed by law to control admission to the casino. And the court, in one sort of case, said that comes under the review because you are applying a law. The law is expressly making reference to a private company. And then there was another case, it's true, it's just one, where someone challenged a decision 
of a Royal Football Association board, and the court refused it because it said the rules of natural justice were not breached. So it was applied for 69A to apply to an organization like the World Football Association. Now I mention this point because under English foreign law, private companies come under judicial review if they perform a public function. So for instance, the world we have only three private companies which provide the what you call it, the telecommunication wireless service. Vodafone, Merita, and Gold. Now, in Britain, probably, you could find that you review action against these private companies because they are providing a very important public service. In Malta, you can't because they are neither a government ministry or department nor are, are they a public corporation. The final point damages. When we enacted Article 4698, there's a special provision to the effect that you are only entitled to damages if your case falls under 469A, if the action of the public authority was in bad faith or else unreasonable. Which therefore limits the occasion where you can request damages, which perhaps explains why sometimes the court says, and it is also unreasonable, so it will allow you to present an action for damages. There are some judgments. One of them is Franco Zopardi, also, and the other one is Carmel Rousseau in, in, in Malta, Carmel Rousseau 2012, and Franco Zopardi 2016, where the court said, apart from these cases, you can only also apply the law of tort under civil code to request damages when an action on public authority is unlawful, which, as you know, of tort is not limited only to bad faith and unreasonableness. It could be all the negatives. So here we are still not deciding there are some conflicting judgments. Of course, those of you who want to find uh, an action for damages, they, they quote these two judgments. While the others are a little bit more restricted. One final matter for those of you who find a constitution election. And the government replies, or the AG replies, ah, but you had the action under 469A and you did not exhaust your own remedies. There are judgments which state that the remedy under 4698 was the subject of this lecture is not as effective, as adequate, as the constitutional remedy. Because 4698 is merely a last decision of the public authority, but not, not, does not substitute its decision for the public authority. While a constitutional court, in granting a constitutional remedy, can do anything. It can include, it can annul a promotion exercise, it can grant a promotion, etc. So some have wriggled out of this uh, pitfall by stating that 4698 is not as adequate as the Constitution. And in conclusion, I will state that judicial review, it's true, it's the cornerstone of our administrative law. And it is the best thrown executive power and keep it in check within clear or presumed parameters established by power. And therefore, it is a very important means of protection of the rights of the individual beyond the human rights section. And the courts have to strike that fine balance between checking executive power, but at the same time allowing a democratically elected government to pursue its functions and duties in accordance with its electoral mandate. Keeping this balance is of the essence in any country based on the rule of